Hello, friends. The interview you're about to listen to was published in an old issue of Cenobium, the Hellraiser magazine. Special effects artist Ed Martinez had the chance to visit the set of Candyman 2 and later conducted a phone interview with director Bill Condon. He was kind enough to send us the typed pages of this magazine and a couple of unpublished photos that were taken on set of the special effects being worked on. Check those out in the blog article accompanying this video. Without further ado, here's a reading of the interview. Ed Martinez, why don't you tell us how you got your start in the business? Bill, back in the beginning, after I went to Columbia College in New York, I came back here to Los Angeles and registered to go to film school. I wrote articles about film at Columbia and then here. I wrote a very long and very critical piece about summer movies that Millimeter Magazine published. I got a call out of the blue from a producer named Michael Laughlin who had made British movies in the early 70s like Joanna and Tulane Blacktop, which was made here, and a few others. He had been living in Britain, had returned to America, and had picked up the magazine and read my article. So he called and said, you have ideas for movies? Do you want to come work for me? So, of course, I never made it to film school. I went to work for him and developed a few things and wrote a script with him called Dead Kids, ultimately released as Strange Behavior. He went off and directed that while I was the associate producer on it. It was made in New Zealand, standing in for the Midwest. It was a very small, offbeat, horror, mad doctor movie. It was released in England and most other countries as Dead Kids. It was fresh after the time when all those kids were murdered in Atlanta. We tried to release it as Dead Kids here in the U.S. and the New York Times wouldn't take the ad. Subsequently, it became Strange Behavior, which actually was a title I liked better anyway. That was in the early 80s, and then we went on to a second film, Strange Invaders, which I wrote but did not direct. Ed, isn't that the one where it's about a whole town of aliens that look like humans, and at the end of the film, as they're walking on board their spaceship, they peel off their human skin and reveal that they're all aliens? Exactly. And with the making of those two films, that's how I knew I wanted to be a director. So I pursued that for a few years, and about two or three years later, got my first chance with a movie called Sister, Sister, which was actually a script that New World gave me called The Louisiana Swamp Murders. It was really kind of a cheesy Friday the 13th ripoff, and I asked them if I could rewrite it. They said yes, and I quickly did. It became kind of a gothic melodrama. I think someone described it as uh, like a Twilight Zone written by Tennessee Williams. We made that in 87 with Janet Jason Lee and Judith Ivey. That came out, and then I wrote a movie that I also directed on cable called Murder 101 with Pierce Brosnan. I actually got an Edgar Award for it. I wrote FX2, and then I did a bunch of cable movies right in a row. I did a movie called White Live with Gregory Hines and Annette O'Toole, as well as Dead in the Water with Brian Brown, Terry Hatcher, and Veronica Cartwright. It's actually the favorite of all the movies I've made, and a film called Deadly Relations with Robert Erick. That brings us up to Candyman 2. It seems I always go back and forth between writing and directing, and of course Candyman 2 was a movie I didn't write, but directed. Ed, how did that project get into your lap? Bill, they had been developing it for a while, and then they decided to go after producers. I met with Clive Barker, and he knew some of my stuff, and after many convolutions, they finally gave it to me. Ed, which films or projects do you know of that he had seen or liked? Bill, I think Sister, Sister and White Lie. Ed, but not Strange Invaders? Bill, he may well have, because I know in talks since then that he had mentioned it, but since I wrote it, I, but I didn't direct it, I don't think that it would have told him anything anyway. I think he was looking at the directing. Then I got involved with Candyman 2 and worked heavily on the script with Mark Kruger. He was the second writer on the movie. Rand Ravitch was the first. Then Mark Kruger did the final draft. Rand had done many drafts earlier. Ed, what happened in the early phases of pre-production? Bill, once we had the script in pretty decent shape, it was a very, very quick pre-production period, about nine weeks for a movie that was actually pretty complicated. We shot sort of equally in both cities, Los Angeles and New Orleans, and had quite a number of effects. Almost all of them, except for three, were practical effects, shot live on set. So it was about really honing the script. In the beginning, casting was a bit of a challenge because 
there's an initial kind of resistance to sequels and horror films in general. So I was calling in favors, trying to get people like Veronica Cartwright, who I had worked with before. We saw a lot of actors and actresses. Uh, Kelly Rowan for the lead just popped out. She was wonderful. Ed, was the film storyboarded? Bill, much of it was. I had the thickest notebook I've ever had making a movie. Every effect sequence was storyboarded. I would say easily 40% of the movie was storyboarded. Ed, including the whole ending sequence every, uh, with the model and everything? Bill, the entire ending sequence. There were a lot of special effects. A company called IntroVision built some models and we had three different sets on a soundstage. Ed, with all the water and mud? Bill, exactly. But really, it was a logistical nightmare. You know, finishing up every day and going over to the storyboard and putting a big X through it and being thrilled to be finished with that shot, getting somewhere with it. Ed, who did the storyboards for you? Bill, a woman called Janik Kushnik. After casting, did you have to go out and scout locations? Oh, yeah, in New Orleans, which was a thrill. I'd worked there before on Sister Sister, but the whole movie was about the birthplace of Candyman and how it sort of claimed him again. You know, when you go to New Orleans, it sets the entire mood. The story of that city is nature reclaiming its own. It's vines and branches of trees growing up out of the sides of buildings. Ed, very gothic feeling? Bill, yeah, just great. What I like about the script and the reason I got involved in this movie in the first place is because I'm a very big fan of the first movie. But this script was its own story, and I would say that this script is very diametrically opposed to the style of the first. I love the first. I love the way Bernard Rose looked around and said, what does a haunted house look like today? What's a place where we are really going to be afraid to step into? And those tenements in Chicago's Cabrini Green are really scary. That was brilliant. Nothing's really scary anymore, and I thought it was very interesting. A completely original take on traditional horror conventions. This movie is a family melodrama that I think goes maybe a little deeper into some of the racial dynamics that were suggested by the first movie. But visually, instead of a daylight realistic approach, it sort of demanded giving in to the gothic. I actually think that some people who, who have been disappointed in the movie, compared to the first one, are responding to that. It is so different, and it does actually play with what I consider to be classic conventions in horror movies. But people who are less charitably inclined would call them cliches. For example, instead of Cabrini Green, we have a sort of haunted mansion and a cemetery. I love going back to basic stuff like that. Ed, tell us a little about the shoot in New Orleans. Bill, it wasn't that bad, really. We sort of lost it by the time we got on the soundstage here in Los Angeles, and we're dealing with bugs and bees and water. New Orleans was fairly easy because almost everything we were shooting was in the French Quarter. What we tried to do there was avoid a tourist view of the city. First of all, a lot of it was set in poor neighborhoods, which are just as bleak as anywhere on the face of the earth, so it was scary sometimes to shoot in places in the middle of the night. Ed, how many days and nights were you on location there? Bill, oh, about 20, I guess, and many, many nights. The other thing is that Mardi Gras in the last 30 years has become very commercialized, and it has big corporate sponsors. There's huge floats now of Mickey Mouse and stuff like that. They don't go through the back streets of the French Quarter anymore, so we found a guy called Henry Schindler who has devoted his life to preserving Mardi Gras as it was before 1960. All of the materials we use in the movie, the costumes, and especially the paper mache floats, are from the turn of the century, either the actual ones or reproductions. We really try to give it a kind of feel of old world, a sort of carnivale feel, instead of the more commercial stuff they do today. Ed, was it very expensive to get his services? Bill, no, it wasn't. I think he was thrilled because it, it drives him crazy that all the film people come into New Orleans and use the same Mardi Gras guy all the time for their films. He was thrilled that they were using him. So he actually became a great asset to the production and saved us a lot of money. Ed, does he have a big warehouse to store all the floats and stuff like that? Bill, he has a small one. The other guy has a big one, but he has a small place where he keeps it all. There were some great images and other things that he provided us with. Icarus falling from the sky and other things that he would give us. He suggested that we use this great pan float that he has with a huge penis. It's hard to see in the movie, but it's in there. Ed, so there's quite a lot of symbolism there. Do you want to tell us any other anecdotes about the New Orleans part of the shoot? 
Bill. We were staging a fake Mardi Gras because we didn't shoot during the real Mardi Gras. We scheduled this for all-night shoots, dust till dawn. It was hard to hold on to any of the extras after the meal break. It came around midnight or 1 o'clock, and because there were so many bars around, we found that by the end of the meal break, there'd be no extras left. That became a big problem for us. People are very dedicated to having a good time down there. Ed, can you tell me about the sequence involving Candyman's origin, where he gets his hands sawed off and the bees kill him? Bill, yes, it's odd because the action is like a lynching. The, the, the mind immediately assumes that you're somewhere in the South, but actually we're flashing back to the setting of the first movie, Cabrini Green, Chicago. The setting of this film, the sequel, began in New Orleans, which was his birthplace, and then made its way to Cabrini Green, where the character dies. So the first challenge is finding anything that would suggest the wide open expanse of Chicago of the 1890s in modern day Los Angeles. The only thing we did find is one field that reminded me a lot of the type of fields that are in the, f in the film Days of Heaven. So that became our sort of look more than anything else. You know, where Cabrini Green was in the 1890s was actually a place called Helltown, which was a ghetto for Italian immigrants that was really quite dangerous. If we had done it realistically, it would have to be more of a kind of quasi-industrial town-like setting. But I didn't think that would look right, so we went with the more mythical open field like the Midwest. Ed, can you tell us about working with live bees on location? Bill, I remember from our last production meeting, we got a lecture from Dr. Norman Gary, the entomologist. There had been very few stings on the first film, and of course, Virginia Madsen, who's allergic to bees, even she felt comfortable doing all this because she hadn't been stung. And somebody piped up and said, well, you know, she hasn't come back to do part two. It may have been true. Um, they had very few stings on the first film, but in ours, I think there were unfortunately plenty of stings. It was never pleasant, especially for poor Tony Todd and Billy Washington, the stunt coordinator who doubled for Tony Todd. I thought it was amusing because Billy is this incredibly macho, brave guy who described how he did a high fall stunt where he jumped 10,000 feet from a plane onto the tarmac with only a deceleration cord stopping him a few feet from the ground. And that didn't faze him at all. But with a swarm of bees stinging him, he couldn't take it. I don't really blame him. It was pretty grim. Ed. In this sequence, who exactly are these town folk? It looked like some of them were in their Sunday best and some were dressed in work clothes. Bill, my sense of it is that they were a crowd of working class folks who were feeling threatened by a rivalry between blacks and whites, and especially of somebody who would seem uppity. Daniel Robitaille, uh, who was the person who became Candyman, was a well-educated black man who went to school in Europe. They felt that he was trying to rise above his station. Their hatred was spurred on by the father of Caroline, Hayward Sullivan. He was a sort of wealthy baron type who wanted to destroy Robitaille for having an affair with his daughter. Ed, I found it disturbing to see children present in this scene mutilating and murdering this black man. Bill, I, I find that so eerie. It, it seemed especially chilling that young boy who first calls Robitaille Candyman has such an innocent face. This whole movie was such a metaphor for racism. It's the sort of guilt we carry from our past. Ed, tell me about the special effects shots. Bill, we used intro vision for a dream sequence where the heroine goes out into a balcony, of which we shot the reverse angles in New, New Orleans. When she turns around, she suddenly sees Candyman caught in the mirror. It's really the glass of the door. Uh, I wanted to get a sense that he was neither behind the glass nor reflected in it, but that he was the glass himself, itself. It's hard to get that idea that he lives in mirrors or in glass, so that without giving anything away to our readers, uh, by the time we get to the climax of the film, what happens kind of makes sense. The only way we could achieve that effect was through the use of the intro vision process. Gary King, the effects cameraman, created the effect in camera using a device called a beam splitter. That's the process by which a man is standing in a blackened booth, so to speak, and there's a 90 degree angled mirror, which is half silvered. This is the, ble the beam splitter and they can use the dialing up of a dimmer on the light in the blackened booth so that he is either transparent or appears to be solid depending upon the way you want the shot to be seen. The ghostly image of Candyman whispers eerily as he appears only a few feet away from our heroine, 
but then his image fades away completely, replaced by the painting, which is a portrait of his lover, Caroline Sullivan, which he painted in the 1890s. The painting also fades away to reveal the ordinary glass. Ed, what kind of other shots were done with introvision? Bill, the bulk of the other shots were of the slave shack, where Candyman was born, being swallowed up by the Mississippi, and, and that involved models, which were built by the Introvision Art Department. Ed, how did you come to use the company that you chose for the makeup effects? Bill, we just met with a lot of people. I think we felt that there were certain slight improvements to make on the hook and the costume. We gave Candyman a sleeker, sexier kind of look than the rat fur that he was wearing on his collar in the first movie. We gave him more of an Armani kind of look. Ed, how did you like working with Tony Todd? Bill, it was great. He's really a wonderful, very well-trained actor. I think in the first movie, they'd shot a lot more than actually made its way into the movie, showing the sort of more tragic side of the character. I think there's a real exploration of the love between Candyman and the Madsen character, and I think they sort of shied away from it all. Tony was disappointed about that, so we try to build into every scene the sense of the tragic loss. We try to make you feel for his character. So many terrible things were done to him, it's hard not to feel sorry for him. Ed, it's kind of like a tragic monster. Bill, yes, like Phantom of the Opera or The Hunchback of Notre Dame. And it was weird because there were a few critics in America that I thought displayed amazing cynicism. They suggested that at the end of the movie, when we find out that the Candyman has been a victim, that it was sort of tagged on to the film in order to justify the fact that throughout the rest of the movie, we had a great big scary black man. I think that it triggers complicated responses in people. And for certain characters, when he murders them, you don't feel 100% happy about that, and your emotions are conflicting. But also, I think the movie was pretty rich thematically. Even though violence can be justified by certain people as a response to the violence that was inflicted upon them, there's got to be another way. The relationship between the teacher and the boy illustrates a kind of healing process. And it had to be the boy who saves her and forgives the white people, and finally comes to see that though he had always identified so strongly with not Candyman the killer, but Candyman the victim. It's interesting to note that there were critics who would acknowledge all of the subtexts, but would say, surely they weren't thinking about that because it's just a slasher movie. Those people have a hard time crediting any kind of thought or ambition to horror movies because they disapprove of them. They don't like horror films to begin with, so they think they must be reading this deeper meaning into it but they've just seen it up on the screen, and they tell us themselves that it's just not there. Some of the best reviews we got were from black journalists. It's sort of amazing how few of them there are when you consider the number of critics there are around the country. And there were more than a few white journalists who complained about the dicey racial politics, and not one of the black journalists mentioned it. It's a bit revealing about our whole country. There you go. That was an amazingly detailed interview. Candyman 2 came out 26 years ago, believe it or not, and this month we get to watch the new Candyman, directed by Nia da Costa, hitting theaters August 27. I hope you enjoyed it. What are your memories of Candyman 2? Are you excited about the new Candyman? Let us know in the comments below. Thanks for listening.